last one you recorded because I tried to watch it. Um, and for some reason, like, I don't know if maybe I was too late on the link. I don't know how many days it's usually posted for, but I couldn't watch Wednesdays. Okay, did you get the email I sent about that a short time ago? Uh, I didn't see it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I answered your, your email about that, uh, like, within the last hour or so. So, uh, uh, that's why. <laughs> okay, so, um, in my other classes, and this may be relevant to the uh, rest of you too, uh, since normally in, like in my normal classes, I record this and then I take the link, and which is to Microsoft Stream, and I post it in Canvas. And in my other classes too, some of my students told me that they could not uh, access the link. And I told them they did not have access. Is that what happened to you, Taylor? Um, okay. And so I asked uh, Susan Rayborn, Susan Rayborn is a staff member in the Office of Online Learning and uh, has all the answers for anything technical. Um, and uh, what she told me is when you go to that link in Microsoft Stream, you're supposed to be prompted to log in. Um, uh, it could be a pop-up locker that's uh, preventing that. Um, and uh, what, what browser do you use, Taylor? I usually use Chrome. Okay, that's unfortunate because she actually recommended Chrome. Uh, <laughs> but with the pop-up blockers turned off, um, and oh, we got some wind and rain now. Um, yay. Um, and uh, whereas uh, Safari and Firefox uh, uh, cause some problems with permissions. Now, uh, what I've done as a workaround is I just took that video, downloaded it, uploaded it to YouTube um, and posted the YouTube link in the Canvas discussion. Um, so certainly it, uh, you should be able to access that. Um, so we have that work around. So I guess why well, post Microsoft Stream anymore, but um, yeah, so that's been uh, one of the many technical hurdles uh, uh, that we've had. Um, so we have a link to Microsoft Stream will show up just in a few minutes, but then Depending on what I have going on, I'll try to get the YouTube one up like within the next uh, hour or so. Um, okay, now um, we will definitely uh, take time today to uh, uh, talk about any uh, MATLAB difficulties, but um, in the interest of mixing things up a little bit, I want to do uh, uh, actually a MATLAB demonstration and also talk about some uh, key numerical analysis concepts that sort of permeate the whole field. Um, it's just not something that I'm going to cover in great depth, but I want to um, at least spend a little time on it anyway, just to give you an idea as to uh, what um, complications trying to solve problems numerically um, can uh, cause, as opposed to when you're trying to work things out um, on paper. Um, so let's see. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen for this uh, document. Come on. Okay. Um, Okay, so as I've mentioned before, when you are um, having a computer do all the arithmetic for you, um, numbers are stored in a uh, fixed amount of space, so usually uh, eight bytes or 64 bits, and uh, as such, there is a, a limited amount of uh, uh, precision. So you, now, it, numbers, of course, are represented in binary, so, um, if you think in terms of like how many decimal digits one might have, well, you really have binary digits, and the maximum binary 
number of binary digits of precision you have is uh, 53, uh, which works out to roughly 16 decimal digits um, of precision. So I want to give you an idea as to the kind of uh, complications um, that can occur as a result of that uh, limited precision. Um, yeah, so, um, so if something as innocuous as the quadratic formula, so if I go ahead and put that here, Okay, um, now normally if you wrote some in MATLAB code, for instance, that implemented the quadratic formula to compute the two roots of whatever quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, it'll work just fine. But what if b squared ah, dang it, is Now, um, okay. Can anyone tell me, in case you've seen it in another class, this symbol right here? Um, actually, that's four AC. Okay. Um, what does this symbol mean, anybody? I don't know if you've had other professors use it. No one has come across that before? Okay. It means much greater than. Um, and similarly, we have the double less than sign is much less than. Now, much greater than, much less than is not rigorously defined. Um, so it um, doesn't have any specific meaning, but uh, but that's the point we want to make is that uh, um, that compared to b squared, 4ac is uh, negligibly small. Like you can almost think of it as being zero, at least relative to, to, to b squared. Um, so then what happens is um, if you look at this expression, minus b plus or minus. Um, OK. Um, like if, if 4ac is negligibly small, then this is roughly the square root of b squared. So it's roughly the absolute value of b plus something very small. So let's say so plus or minus b, or sorry, absolute value of b plus some epsilon, where epsilon is small. Um, So when it happens, um, okay, so, so let's assume that, uh, um, okay, so one of these is going to be nearly zero. Like, for example, suppose uh, B is positive, then we choose a plus sign and we get uh, something nearly zero. Or, um, okay, uh, if we choose a minus sign, we would get um, minus 2b, uh, whereas if b is negative and we choose a plus sign, then we get the uh, plus 2b. Um, actually, or two absolute value of b. So depending on whether you choose a plus or sign or minus, you're going to get one of these results. Something that's approximately minus 2b or approximately zero. Okay. Um, now, um, what happens if you subtract nearly equal numbers? Well, let's take a look at that. Um, okay. Um, so I'll just make up some numbers here. Okay, so 
So I'm going to keep these numbers the same, except I'm just going to change a few digits. OK, so let's suppose we're subtracting these numbers. So what will happen is we have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 12 digits um, represented here. So the first nine digits will cancel. Um, so the result will be Um, so we have that. So these nine digits that result from cancellation, that's lost precision um, in, in your results. So, um, so in other words, uh, is, suppose these numbers come from prior computations, for example, computing B squared or computing 4AC. Um, so there's already some error in there. So if these numbers are extremely close to each other, then um, whatever error there is in either of these um, now becomes the dominant part of a number because these digits are correct, the, the, the non-zero the digits that don't cancel. But whereas you had 12 digits of precision before, now you only have three. So you could literally give away all of your precision by um, uh, subtracting numbers that are close to one another. Um, and this is called catastrophic uh, cancellation. Um, uh, when this happens. So, so, so really, it's when cancellation can happen for any time you're subtracting two numbers that are close. But if a number is result from prior computations, so they already have some error in them, um, then, uh, um, then what happens is that's what we call a catastrophic. Uh, so the result they consist mostly of error that results from prior computations. Therefore, the result is essentially useless beyond whatever digits that didn't cancel here. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, what do you do? Uh, that depends on the task you're performing. Um, it turns out that sometimes you can take a formula that seemed fine when you use it on paper, or um, and you might be able to manipulate it to get it into a different form that gets rid of the uh, problematic subtraction. So I'm going to assume that B is positive. So when that happens, um, it's when we choose the plus sign that we have this cancellation error. Otherwise, your choose minus we have numbers of the same sign. OK, so here's what we do to fix it. Um, all right, so we need to copy that original formula. OK. Um, and I'm going to do some algebraic trickery here. Now, I actually only care about the plus sign. OK. And therefore, I'm going to have a minus sign over here. What is it called when I do this? I multiply and divide by this expression. So here I have this expression of a plus, but then I have the same expression but with a ch sign changed in the middle. Uh, what is that called? Anybody? Uh, the the yes, the conjugate. I barely picked that up through all the awful connection. Um, OK, so then we can go ahead and uh, simplify this. OK, so I'm going to have um, minus 2a times all this down below. That's not the interesting part. Okay. All right, but one thing I want to point out, though, here we had uh, a plus sign. Uh, so here we have numbers of opposite signs. 
here, it's numbers of the same sign. So this operation was problematic. This one is fine. But what happens up here? So then we have um, b squared minus b squared minus 4ac. Um, so then we get some cancellation and we get um, just plain old 4ac up top once we simplify. And then the a's will cancel and so will the two. There. Um, so here's your other quadratic formula. Um, so, so, so what happens is, again, assuming B is positive, we go ahead and use this formula for a case of a minus sign. Um, and then, uh, so, so that one's okay. For a plus sign, we don't use this formula, we use this one. So in other words, either way, uh, we can use both these formulas. Each one will compute one of the roots safely. So, so if uh, B is negative, then we just do the opposite. Like we use this one for a plus sign and we fix the minus sign root um, in this case in, in, in this, using the same approach. Okay. <clears throat> Questions about that? <clears throat> so there are lots of cases like this where um, you can uh, rewrite a formula to remove a problematic subtraction like that one. Now, it may seem like this term, calling this catastrophic cancellation, is melodramatic. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about um, an actual catastrophe that resulted from this kind of subtraction. This is the 1991 Iraq War. Um, and uh, so we have Patriot missiles intercepting uh, Iraqi Scud missiles. So what's done? Um, we need to, uh, to perform a successful interception, we need to get the Scud missile's trajectory. So we estimate its velocity at various points in time. So we have uh, P2 minus P1. So if you give these as position vectors, divided by difference in time. So we get a velocity estimate that way. Now, um, the values T1 and T2 are very close together. Uh, so we're getting, a, we're measuring a position, tracking it by radar at very small intervals, uh, so we can get an accurate um, velocity estimate. Um, now, so in other words, the difference between these is a small number. Now, when T1 and T2 are small, this is not a problem. So um, subtracting nearly equal numbers, it's only a problem if the result, like in this case, is much smaller than the numbers you're subtracting. Um, but after your tracking equipment, that's computing these velocity estimates. Whoops, runs for a long time. T1 and T2, dang it. Sorry, sometimes this editor drives me nuts. They're still close together, but now they're larger in magnitude than they were before. That's when this subtraction goes bad. Um, so bad subtraction leads well, okay. So it leads to a bad velocity estimate. Um, so the interception fails uh, because we miscalculated with God's trajectory. Um, 
So a missile, a Scud missile got through. And uh, 28 American troops lost their lives. Um, so when they investigated to find out how this could happen, because this is after several successful um, Scud interceptions, why did this one fail? And when they investigated, they found out that this was a problem, that as uh, when they're tracking for a long time, um, and these numbers, T1, T2, were allowed to get large, uh, it threw off the estimates. So here was their solution. Reboot the tracking equipment. Eight hours, uh, man, these, that put a bound on how large these numbers would get. Um, and uh, so they deemed that after eight hours, these numbers were going to get somewhat large, but not so large. So that was deemed an acceptable amount of error um, in the uh, velocity estimate. And that worked. So this did not happen again. Um, so, and uh, this is all documented online. Uh, this is mentioned in, in my book, and there's a reference there to um, all the government's documents about, uh, about the situation. So, um, so, so when we say catastrophic cancellation, unfortunately, uh, we really do mean it. And this is such an insidious kind of issue. You would think, oh, I just program up this formula. That's going to work. It's fine. And most of the time it does. But then uh, all of a sudden, because of failure to take into account floating point arithmetic issues, um, something uh, can, can go terribly wrong. Um, and this is why algorithms, numerical methods, must be designed in such a way as to so that you can trust the answers that you're getting. Um, and because sometimes, uh, because of floating point issues, um, you can get uh, very strange behavior. And I'm going to do a quick demonstration of that in MATLAB, and then we'll spend the rest of our time there anyway. Um, I have here uh, ordinary looking matrix. Um, and I'm going to solve, whoops. Okay. Um, all right, so there's a matrix A. And I'm going to solve the system AX equals B, but I'm going to solve two of them. So I have two vectors, uh, B1 and B2. And I'll solve these two systems to get solutions X1 and X2. Now let's take a look at B1 and B2. Notice they look almost exactly the same. We have one digit difference down here. Now I want to emphasize, if I do format long and look again, remember format is only about display. These numbers are represented in full precision internally. This is that for display, we show only this many digits or this many. And we see that um, yeah, there are more substantial differences beyond the first three digits. But still, these vectors are fairly close to one another. In fact, if I use norm, norm is like absolute value, but for vectors and matrices. I want to get an idea of a magnitude of their difference. This is called a relative error. Um, so you think of like exact minus approximate over exact. So uh, okay, so that's roughly 10, uh, 10 to the minus 4. Um, so, so these vectors differ from one each other by only 1 one hundredth of 1%. So you might think, okay, if I go ahead and solve these systems with B1 and B2, the solutions should be roughly the same. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we use a backslash operator. So. If I do x1 is a backslash b1. So that's the same as a inverse times b1. But, but use this to compute it, not this. I'll go, I'll explain why next semester when you take numerical linear algebra. Um, okay, there's our solution. For the first one, now I do the second one. Well, that's a bit different. Um, so, so what actually happened here is uh, 
A is called an ill-conditioned uh, matrix. Uh, so a condition number indicates, gives a measure of how much the output can change relative to a change in the input. The condition number is pretty big. It's uh, so it's nearly uh, um, a million. Um, <laughs> so um, now, yes, I did contrive this example to be that way, but sometimes this happens out in the wild, especially when trying to solve differential equations. Ill-conditioned matrices abound there. Um, figures that, that that's, that's my specialty area. So, um, so this can happen where slight change in the input could lead to a unbelievably large change um, in the output. That's what conditioning is about. Um, and uh, certain problems are uh, very poorly conditioned compared to others. Um, now, one thing you come across in the tutorial, um, polynomial functions. Uh, if I make up a polynomial, um, well, this is when you delve in the first problem, x squared minus 5x plus 6. So I could use the roots function to get the roots of p, so 3 and 2. Now, what I could also do is poly takes as input for roots, and uh, output is a coefficient of polynomial that has these roots. So that would be 1 minus 5 and 6. Uh, now, it makes the leading coefficient 1. So roots and poly are basically inverses of one another. So this goes from coefficients to roots. This goes from roots to coefficients. So you might think, OK, if I do this, roots of poly 1 to 3. Here's a colon operator that comes up in the tutorial. This, so this is a vector 1, 1, 2, 3. And I should get 1, 2, 3 back. I mostly do. There's a little bit of rounding error there. Um, actually, I bet if I did format short, yeah, so essentially it's one, two, and three. Now, let's take a server. What about one to 20? I should get the numbers one to 20 back. Not so much. Um, so that, that didn't go well. Um, and in fact, if I went further, say uh, 1 to 50, those are your real roots, but here I get complex numbers, I mean, and with significant imaginary parts. And um, so this was a complete failure. Um, polynomial roots can be a terribly ill conditioned problem at times. Um, so Using the, the best known methods out there, like you know, the methods that MATLAB implements, um, can still uh, give you wrong answer, at least in certain cases. Okay. Um, now, um, all right. So there's some. Numerical analysis quirks that it's important to be aware of, of all the things that can uh, go wrong. And those of you who end up doing research in this area, be prepared to get bitten by that, by, by any of these things, um, as, as I have. Um, <clears throat> you think, oh, I got a great algorithm going here. I mean, you try it out in MATLAB. Looks great on paper. Try it out, and it's like, oh, whoops. Because you didn't take into account problematic uh Computations like like cancellation and so forth. Okay, now, um, how is the um, uh, MATLAB tutorial uh, and uh, the chapter one problems going? Dare I ask? Um, I think um, it's okay, great, but I'm but strong. I'm strong. <laughs> but it's it's a good. Sorry, but the, the audio is so <laughs> awful today. Um, I think I heard every other syllable there. Oh, uh, repeating that to me too. 
Um, I don't know why. Oh, now I'm not. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can. I, I don't know why it does that sometimes. Um, I was just saying I'm struggling personally, but the tutorial is really good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a that could be for more reasons than, yeah, that could just be amazing, but. Okay. Um, well, does anyone have any? Uh, now, definitely some of these problems are uh, more of a pain than others, um, especially some of the ones toward the end. Um, I just from giving this assignment in previous classes that I, I see, I'm, there, are no, there are no surprises as to which problems get fixed, uh, like some of the ones you brought to my attention earlier today. Um, so, uh, uh, so does anyone have any of uh, those problems that you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't know about everyone else, but uh, what was there was one on vector norms, and we never really covered that in my okay. undergrad. Maybe like briefly for a second introduced it. Okay. Um, and I um, well okay. Which one is that? Uh, and yes, that is one that is kind of a pain. Um, okay. Ah, so number one, so one point two point twelve. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> you yourself too soon. Um, okay, so now, um, sometime after class, uh, um, I would suggest that you take a look at um, uh, the appendix section that I referenced there. Uh, just to know about norms in general. Um, but I'll um, take the most relevant uh, bits and pieces from that and talk about that here. And, and yes, I'm pretty sure that all four of you will appreciate anything I have to say about this problem. Um, okay. Uh, whoops. Okay. Stop it. All right. So. OK. Um, now, um, so let's suppose we have, as I mentioned, the problem, some vector x. And it's allowed to be complex. Oh, um, so I need to fix my LaTeX here. I want to be able to use the um, fancy symbol for complex numbers. Um, ah, there it is. Um, OK. Um, the L2 norm. Can you share? Can you share? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that I unshared. Oh, it's OK. OK. Um, What I found from today's classes is that my students in any class need to watch me like a hawk because I will screw up in any way imaginable. Um, it was actually meant to, meant to make you all feel better when you do the same. Um, OK, now, um, so a formula for it would be this. Um, All right, so the two indicates L2 norm, and we'll see what that really means. Um, OK. So we take each of the components, absolute value squared. Now, you know this as Euclidean length, um, and in depending on the conventions used by your calculus book, might have used either a single bar which makes it look like absolute value, or maybe the double bar. Um, and uh, we have, um, so because the elements of X can be complex, we must take the absolute value of each component and square it, not just ordinary squaring, uh, except for real numbers. Uh, and so it's a square root of sum of squares, so a distance formula um, is what you might know it as. Um, so it's just vector magnitude. 
Um, now, um, now to express this as matrix multiplication, and one thing I want to make clear here, assuming X is a column vector, vectors are column vectors. I want to make that clear up front. Um, so anytime you see a bold letter like this anywhere in the book, it's referring to a column vector. Okay. Um, now, um, so this same formula can be written this way uh, as X Hermitian transpose of X. Um, that would be the L2 norm squared. Um, so it, it's the same summation in here. Um, as opposed to X transpose X. Now that would be the sum of Xi squared, but notice it's without the absolute value. Um, so if X is real, then there's no distinction between these. Um, all right, but uh, uh, okay. So I should have. Um, because you might not have seen this either in, as an undergrad. Um, the Hermitian transpose is where you take your regular transpose. Um, and then take the complex conjugate. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind that, dang it, if I take a complex conjugate of a number, if I multiply it by the number itself, that is the absolute value of, or modulus of a complex number uh, squared. So that's what's happening when using the Hermitian transpose that gives us this sum, these two sum of all the absolute values squared. Um, but if um, if xi is, let's suppose it's an imaginary number, so like it's minus 2i, for instance, then we square it, we get something negative. Um, so um, we have to use the Hermitian transpose um, for defining the norm, which is a notion of magnitude of a vector Uh, to guarantee that's not negative. So if I use a regular transpose, but on complex vectors, I could come up with an X so that I go ahead and compute this. I think, oh, sum of squares, that'll be positive. And it's not, it could be negative, it could be zero, it could be complex. Um, anything can happen here. So that's why for a lot of um, concepts that are defined using the transpose when applied to real vectors, if you're going to generalize that to complex vectors, you have to switch to the Hermitian transpose. So this problem is about coming up with specific vectors X, therefore would not be real, they must be complex, where if you, if you compute this, it's fine, you get a non-negative number, but if you compute this, you'll get something that's uh, negative or zero or complex. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's the idea is that you try to come up with, um, for instance, you, you, you can, you can assume just to make it simple, um, come on, let's assume that n equals two. So you're just coming up with a 
vector of two elements. So that if you compute something like this, you'll get something that's not a positive real number. So in this problem, it has three parts. So negative, zero, imaginary. So you come up with three different x's that will make this happen. Does the score be under, underscore the importance of using the Hermitian transpose when it's warranted? Questions about that? Or any other? You sure I, I, I have a question. Can you hear can you me? Hear? Now can I can. Um, the exploration, the one after that, 1.2.13. Okay. Um, so we're creating a, a column vector of the 10 random numbers between negative 10 and 10. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm overthinking it. I'm just, do, we're, we're trying to make the vector like where we're putting in the rand command, right? The random command. Yep. Um, I'm struggling with getting, I guess, the A to B, the negative 10 to 10 range, but okay. still getting the. Um, so this goes to an earlier problem, uh, right, right. 1.2.5, where you had to compute um, a random matrix of elements between minus one and one. Yeah, I thought I was working it, and then I look back and I don't know. <laughs> okay, oh, so, so, you didn't, so you didn't complete that one? No, 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 I, I completed it. I was like, I swear we did this at some point, but. Okay, so yeah. I think I think at the wrong area. Okay, yeah. Uh, so okay. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you can use the same approach there and then multiply that by 10. Okay, multiply it by 10. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. What else you got? to see that some of you are approaching with the halfway point. One of the things I'm having difficulty with is like, I feel like I have to do each problem by itself because if I make one mistake, I can't do like, if I hit enter, I can't delete it and it kind of messes up. Am I just an idiot and I don't know how to delete like a single line? Because if I have to keep like redoing entire programs, I'm going to cry. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so can you give me a specific example to make to make sure that I answer your question or uh, resolve your dilemma correctly? So like, when I very first started, I remember it because I just looked at it and was like, oh my gosh, you're an idiot. It was like one of the very, very first couple problems and it was just entering like a equals this. Well, instead of A, I typed a different number in, and I hit enter, but I couldn't go back and uh, like delete that and change. Well, because you could use the arrow key to scroll back for your commands, like the up and down arrows. Yeah. yeah. Okay, or, that, or you're talking about something else. I, I, I know I can like scroll back up for it, but... Once I hit enter, is there a way to delete it out of the program, or do you just have to kind of like clear everything? And once it's uh, in there, it's in there. I need to have a better understanding of what you mean by delete it out of a program because uh, I think I know what she means. It's, yeah, I, I, okay, I, so she's saying that what she's turning in the whole text file, it's going to have her mistakes on it, 
Is so a, what she can do is either go to the text file and delete what you wrote into the program that was wrong and just keep what was right. So you can just do it after and then delete. But you can't would, delete oh, it. OK. Yeah, because a, a diary that it writes is just an ordinary text file. You can do anything you want to that afterwards. OK, see, that's what I was running into the issue of is like. <laughs> I saw a light go off in her head, too. <laughs> I didn't realize yeah. I could do all that because I've literally been like saving each one by itself because I don't want to like have errors showing up because like if I make oh, okay. two or three errors but my program's fine then it's really annoying. Okay. You, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah you can also like something I've been doing is turning the diary off and then like playing around and practicing with the other examples and then turning it back on when I'm ready to write in what I want to that file. So you mean like a rehearsal? What? what? So you mean like a rehearsal? Well, not like the homework problem, but the ones that are in between that aren't part of the homework. OK. Oh, like the practice or whatever it's called. OK, I see what you're saying. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so I thought you meant like doing a dry run before you actually <laughs> committed to the diary. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Like the thing is, when you talk about deleting for a program, I, I, I wanted to find what you meant about like, you know, having this junk in your diary file, and I'm like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> so, um, actually, I have had some students that just turn in their whole diary, warts and all, um, and uh, so I have to, I have to sift through it. Um, and I think, uh, oh, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in an earlier class. I hope I did. I hope instead of just like answering someone's question, but um, yeah, in your diary, if you use uh, comments, like so, if I use, you, see, you see me use comments in my demonstrations, where you, as soon as you type a percent sign, the rest of the line is ignored and treated as a comment. So if you use, if you put, um, like if you edit, uh, or, or uh, you, you even put comments in up front, or you can edit the file afterwards, like like Chelsea said, if you could use that to. As long as I'm navigating through your diary file and I can clearly see, okay, this is one, two, one, this is one, two, two, this is one, two, three. So if you have some way of just identifying where a problem starts and ends, that'll make it easy for me to, to look through. My, 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 that's easy. Like it's a like long, but you're saying, I don't know, we can edit the files afterwards. Yeah. Come with them. Yes. I didn't realize. Yeah, I don't know. Why I didn't realize that. You probably told me, and I probably um, actually. I don't, I don't. I don't think it came up. Um, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it. it that, that's actually why I recommend when you do when you do the diary command, because if you just do diary by itself and MATLAB creates a file, it just calls it diary with no extension. Uh, and I don't like doing that. I like to be, put the .txt extension on it. Because mm -hmm. then you can open it with whatever text editor. You can open it in Notepad or whatever. Um, so yeah, um, hack away at it <laughs> um, uh, before you, to, you know, clean it up, whatever you want to do before you send it in. Um, one thing I, I think I remember grumbling to somebody about this. Uh, I, I might have been like uh, when you were asking questions about it, Walker, but. Um, one thing I don't like about MATLAB's diary feature is, OK, so it writes your commands and your output. But it's hard to tell them apart because I like having those prompts in there, uh, the, the double greater than sign prompt. And MATLAB does not put that in a diary file. So what sometimes what I do is instead of using a diary, I just copy, I, I copy and paste the text directly from a command window because that will have the prompts. Now, you're limited in what you can do with that because you can, um, uh, like at some point, MATLAB's output buffer runs out. But if you if you haven't done very much, uh, then you can go ahead and copy and uh, copy that text, and it might be a little easier to read. Because um, I'm just gonna like open up your diary file in the text editor and just look through it. Uh, I, I don't need to like run anything. Um, is, is I have a question. 
Yeah. Is there another way that you can save it other than diary because I know, and then do it as a PDF? Because I know when we used Maple, it had where you would enter in and then your output. So like it had that separation so you could see what we were putting in and what the computer was giving back out. I don't know if MATLAB does anything like that or if you just specifically want us to use the diary version. I, I say diary because that's just what I'm accustomed to. But again, I started using MATLAB nearly 30 years ago. <laughs> so if, they, if MathWorks has put in some feature like what you're describing, um, that, that might be there. And, it, and I just that's something that I've ever felt the need to use, so I wouldn't know about it. Um, if you do come across that, feel free to use it. I don't really care. I'm just giving you a way to present your work. Um, and because uh, like some of my some of my students have done things using like MATLAB live scripts and so forth, and that's just not something I've needed my for my own purposes. So I haven't taken the time to look at what one does with that. Um, just as an example, but I'm not aware of any feature that would take like your command session and write it directly to a PDF. Um, uh, like when I want to present things like from a MATLAB session, I I. I put it in LaTeX and present it that way. But um, and what I probably do sometimes during a semester is show you guys some LaTeX, um, but not yet. Um, so, um, so sorry, yeah. So unfortunately, you're, you're dealing with a somewhat of a MATLAB relic um, who has kept up with the development of certain new features, but probably not all. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm not that nitpicky, just in general. Um, like, if, if, you have, if you're wondering, like, oh, am I allowed to do this? You know, you know uh, especially when it comes to you know presentation and so forth. You know, in this class, you might as well just assume the answer is yes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you can check with me anyway. But um, I, I've heard horror stories of professors taking off a zillion points for stupid little things. And yes, I have had some colleagues like that in this department. Um, I don't think they're here anymore, though, so you don't have to worry about them. Um, and uh, I just don't play that way. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I want to make sure everyone's aware of. Um, OK. Um, wait, where's my, that's weird. It's not showing me my. Menu bar, okay. Oh, okay. So now I'm on a Mac. If it may be different from you for you if you're on Windows, but look at layout. Um, so a very useful window to me is Command History. I have it docked. Um, you might not by default, but if you select docked then it'll include it in your layout. So here I have, here's my command window, here's my files, um, here's my variables, here's my command history. Um, so, uh, so what you can do is, um, if you've made a bunch of attempts at something, uh, maybe you've made some mistakes, and then you finally get it right, then what you can do is, um, for example, I can go here and do a multiple select, um, and I I can copy uh, these commands. Um, and like, if I, for instance, I want to save them into a text file, or I can run them. Um, so I just executed them all in one shot. Um, so I found that feature to be helpful. Um, when I'm trying different sequences of commands and trying to get them right. And then, like, suppose I want to put them into a M file, which we'll deal with later. Um, I, can, I can copy them and paste them in there. Um, so maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe my goal is to write a MATLAB function. So I play around at the prompt first, figure out what I want to do, and then copy those exact commands uh, into my file. Um, or just run them again from a prompt. Um, so, so command history is your friend. Um, even if MATLAB is your mortal enemy, which I wouldn't be surprised is true for at least some of you by now. 
<clears throat> okay. Um, other questions at all? I have one. Just, yep. just, 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 I didn't know if it was written there or if it was something we were supposed to. Okay, it, that is coming. Like, based on how, how far you all have gotten in the tutorial, you haven't got to that part yet. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, it, it, it'll come. So, but in a nutshell, M files are files where you put MATLAB commands. Like, like you have command, put commands that you might have typed at the prompt. Or functions. So you could say, you know, function whatever. Um, and uh, so then you can call your MATLAB function that gets loaded from that file. So, so both files are M files, um, and uh, so you can. Uh, so, so as you get to the later problems, you can read the section on M files. There'll be several examples there. Uh, first, with uh, script M files, which are just files full of commands that you could type at the prompt just as well. And then after that, uh, it'll be a function M files. Um, but yeah, there's, there's plenty of examples of those in, okay. uh, in the tutorial. Any other? Since we still have some time. Um, I may have talked to some of you individually about our student organization assignment. I brought it up last time, didn't I? In a previous class, right? The, the SIAM student chapter. Yes, no? Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you know, uh, I've been, I've been talking with the officers, um, those, uh, one of our grad students, Chandler Shimp, and also two um, undergrads uh, who are the officers. Um, we are working on getting like a first meeting uh, set up. Uh, it'll probably be sometime like on a Friday afternoon because that'd be the only time it, they could do it. Um, and uh, we'll have the inauguration of our new president. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about what activities we might do during the year. So I want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, also, um, uh, we do have a uh, Siam conference that's coming up in quite a while from now um, in May, but after spring semester ends. And I'm hoping that by then we'll have this dang pandemic reasonably under control so that we can actually have conferences again. Uh, this one's in New Orleans. Um, so it's the Siam meeting on applied linear algebra um so we're looking to have some students there so it's like some of the more experienced students who have been doing some research um uh, would have something to uh, present there and maybe we can get some newer students who um uh, are uh, like y'all who are just starting uh to uh see what the experience is like um so i just wanted to make you aware of that uh, we definitely want to have you get some Siam conference uh, experience while y'all are here, um, public health permitting. Um, so, um, okay, now, uh, so I just want to make sure that this is, um, so one more time, uh, that uh, are there any further questions? Or I'm sure you'll bug me with them later. Because <laughs> uh, there's going to be some problems coming up later on uh, that are doozies um, uh, when you're dealing with uh, M files and such. Um, okay, now um, in this class, I would like to be fairly loose about things like due dates um, because I don't want to have some preconceived notion 
of uh, how long these things should take. And also, especially this first assignment with MATLAB, because MATLAB can be such a pain, as you're all discovering. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone you know, feels comfortable with it before I have you writing MATLAB code that deals with act, you know, other material that I'll be covering later, such as like the next topic will be polynomial interpolation. Um, so, um, so here's what I can do. I'm gonna, I, I want to give you guys a choice. Feel free to let me know how you feel about it. Um, that during class time, like for instance, starting with Wednesday, I, I'll probably have more freaky tidbits to demonstrate for you like I did today. But um, aside from that, um, I can start, uh, I can either reserve these upcoming class periods just to talk about MATLAB, uh, because I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about, um, or start covering other material uh, and therefore fit more in, uh, in, in the semester. So with the disclaimer that there is absolutely no right or wrong answer to this question, <laughs> Um, I'd like to know what, what is your, your preference? Uh, do I leave this as for the time being, like for instance, you know, the rest of this week, probably into next week as well, just about the MATLAB? Or, um, because I mean, there'll be time for questions no matter what. Um, but, uh, otherwise I can, uh, um, and make it split between you know questions that are most likely to be on MATLAB and uh, um, other stuff. I, 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 okay. All right. So that's that's, that's, that's a vote for that. Someone tells me there will not be much dissent. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Um, well. There you have it then. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, that's, and actually, that does help me because once I need to, like, once I want to move to the next chapter, like, in, like, on interpolation, then I got to prepare stuff. <laughs> so, um, and I'm, I'm not ready to do that just yet. Um, so, okay. Cool. So, MATLAB it is. So, um, see what you can do between now and Wednesday to uh, at least get a start on problems. Um, uh, and if, if, if you find that you're not able to you know, like hit a wall with it, um, you can try moving to the next, uh, and bring your questions, uh, so that we can address as many as possible, uh, during class on Wednesday. Of course, you're also welcome to bug me with questions at any time, really. Um, so, um, and, and some students are better than others at taking advantage of that availability, but. I want all of you to uh, feel free to do that. So, um, I mean, I'm a professor. I have no life. So, okay. Um, uh, well, no, I, honestly, I love it because I, I'm, I feel like I'm literally being paid to be myself, uh, which is the kind of career that I hope everybody finds, uh, whatever that may be. So, um, so if I'm not answering your question, I'm probably answering someone else's anyway. So. Um, so be sure to get in line. Um, OK, so if there are no other, um, then uh, I will uh, um, end the recording um, and get the ball rolling and getting us posted um, in, uh, in Canvas. So um, the last chance for any questions <laughs> before I uh, cut off. I was thinking of how when I when I moved to the South eleven years ago, everybody used the phrase "cut off." I didn't know that "cut on" was a thing um, until I came to Mississippi. So, um, so a lot of things like that are like, "What? That's what people say?" I'm like, "Okay, um, sorry, just couldn't help myself." Um, Okay, and uh, so I hope everything's going well with your other classes, you know, whether it's real analysis or ODEs or whatever you're being subjected to, um, and teaching, it's <laughs> which is extra adventurous this time around. So, okay, so I'll well, look forward to seeing y'all Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs>